begin our recording. Hello, hello, and welcome everyone. Thank you for being here with our community conversations. We're having a conversation about sustainability here in our great state. And we've got three of my esteemed colleagues in this space here to facilitate a very, very necessary conversation. So I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves, but as a, a first way of you introducing yourself to this space, I'd like for you to use the chat, put in your name, what organization you're representing, or if you're representing yourself, let us know who you are. If you have pronouns that you want us to use, that would be great as well. And we just thank you for being here. My name is Dawn Stone. I'm the Director of Community Initiatives and Equity at the Center for Nonprofit Management. And I've been in position since April. So this is a relatively new position for me, but I'm no stranger to CNM and I've been a consultant since 2019. So the, the goal for today's conversation is to have just that, a conversation around, yes, yes, around, very good, uh, King, I will do that, uh, around sustainability. And one of the things that we are asking um, if you are comfortable to make it more communal, we would love to see your beautiful faces. Um, if you can turn your video on and your sound off, that would be wonderful because we want to connect with you. We want to see you beyond your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> and so if, if you're comfortable with that, hey, thanks for being here. Uh, it, it just makes it better for us because we are people and we need those connections. So talking about connections. Let's go ahead and start connecting the dots. And I would like to introduce our first host and then he's gonna kick it off to everyone else. And I'm putting him on the spot. Yes, Everett, I am. Uh, I would like to introduce you to Everett. Everett, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Okay, Everett, go ahead. Tell everyone who you are and why we are here today. And you can kick it off to King and Jessica after that. Sure. Yeah, no, my name's Everett Davis. Um, and I mean, really, I was asked to do this. Um, I am the executive director of a new startup nonprofit called Network for Sustainable Solutions. And basically what we are doing is making a one stop shop for sustainability. So that is a digital platform where it's all about measurement of trying to figure out everybody on the ground across the state that's doing the excellent sustainability work. Um, and then from that, we do we do networking events, coalition events, and um, community and action, collective action. That's the, the word I was looking for. Um, yeah, and then I have experience in uh, compliance work in the environmental space uh, with a firm here in town. Um, I've been a project manager for some energy efficiency work and uh, used to be the uh, sustainability coordinator for Music City Center. So um, I've been in this space for a little bit. Um, there's several people on this call that have much more experience than I do. So I also will be uh, happy to hear from them as well. And then I will pass it off to either King or Jessica, whoever wants to go. Hey, good morning. Um, I'm always so slow with the mute button. <laughs> but um, yes, thank you, Everett. Thank you for uh, Dawn for inviting me uh, and Transit Alliance to participate in this panel. Uh, I am. I'm feeling a little bit out of the league, out of my league here. I don't typically talk about sustainability uh, primarily, but it transportation does impact sustainability quite a bit, and um, I look forward to getting into that. I'm the president and CEO for the Transit Alliance of Middle Tennessee. I've been in a uh, leadership position for over two years, but I've been with the organization for over four. Um, I really like the trajectory so far, but there is still so much work to do in terms of getting our transportation options and modes up to speed with our population growth um, to help uh, support better sustainability in our uh, city and region. Um, so I've worked for nonprofits my entire adult life since graduating college at Middle Tennessee State University, and um, I just, for whatever reason, I've just loved doing uh, the Lord's work, as they say, right, <laughs> out helping communities uh, live their best life uh, as we can. Um, so appreciate being here. Look forward to the conversation. And King, um, I'm passing the baton to you. Morning, everybody. My name is King Ajay Frimpong. And I'm actually new here to Tennessee, moved here uh, back in July. So I'm excited to be here and, and fellowship with you all. I currently work as a consultant for the Bridge Band Group. 
where we help nonprofits and philanthropies uh, uh, craft strategies to, to really help them make the impact they want to see in the world and ideally that world being more just and, and equitable. So before that, though, I worked in northeastern Pennsylvania for a community action agency and everything we did there was designed to alleviate poverty. Uh, if it's creating more energy efficient homes, if it's providing uh, food for families in food deserts, if it's uh, uh, giving people the opportunity to, to work, you know, that we, we, we did our best to cover all of that. So I'm definitely stoked to be here. Like Jessica, I've been in the uh, nonprofit space my entire life. And, uh, and I'm now excited to make Tennessee my home. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Everett, King, and Jessica for, for taking the torch. I, I kind of voluntold them that they would be here. And those of you who know me or don't yet, you will be on the hook. I've already sent some emails. So it's good to have um, everyone here. And what I'd like to do, just so we can get a feel, I know I've asked you to do it in the chat. Uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to see. I would love to hear um, your voices, um, let you know that we welcome you. And so if you also could chime in, unmute, I can call you, I can go by my list here. We just like to know who you are, who you represent, and what brings you here today. Lean in our expression, very simply stated. So are there any volunteers before I go down my list? Well, since I have to unfortunately leave a little bit and then come back, I'll start. Adam Bronstown. I work for a nonprofit, the Jewish Federation of Nashville. My real interest is is really kind of like citizen interested. Uh, I've been doing sustainable development work in in various organizations for years and years, um, and so this has always been something that um, very much interests and concerns me. Um, and we in my house, we live a, a plant based diet and we do that for ethical reasons. Um, uh, but we also do that um, for, you know, ethical health reasons, but also for ethically environmental reasons as well. Um, uh, so, uh, again, just something that's personal and also been very, very professional in my life. So apologies for having to leave in the middle for another meeting, but I, 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 I will try to come back as soon as I can. If I ask a question when I come back that someone's already stated, please forgive me. That's all right, Adam. We love you being here. Thank you so much. And we got a plant-based over here. I've got a vegan who's very sustainable. She's also a well worshiper. That's all I'll say. Who's next? What about you, Jacqueline? Good, good morning, all. Um, Jacqueline Machupi with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. I unfortunately have to leave early as well, but it's for a site visit at a state park. Um, so it's always good to be outside. Um, and Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation actually oversees our 56 state parks, which are free and accessible to everyone. They are award winning and we're really proud of them. Um, and I get the opportunity to support them in my role in external affairs, but see a lot of friends and familiar faces on this call. And Don, thank you so much for bringing this conversation to CNM. Um, I see your fingerprints all over CNM since you've joined in the short time. It's not lost on me or other people. So I could go on, but I, I'll stop there. I love it, Jacqueline. Thank you. And that's exactly what I'm trying to be is sticky fingers. I'm going to like, get this girl off of the set, please. <laughs> Thanks, Jacqueline. Judy. I love Judy. Good seeing you again. <laughs> Thank you. Judy Frudenthal with Oasis Center. And I was more in the program arena and recently stepped out of that leadership role into development to do legacy giving part-time and sustaining the agency that way, although my focus has been more community-based programming until this point. Um, but I really appreciate being part of this group, so thank you. Well, Judy, it's always a good day when I see you on a call or in person or somewhere walking around this city. So thank you for being here. Thanks. <laughs> Mary. Hi, Mary. Good morning. Hi. Um... Good way to start off my Friday morning. I'm with Hands-On Nashville, as well as the University of Tennessee's College of Social Work. 
Um, and I think um, sustainability is incredibly important, especially as we're seeing more and more disasters hit the Tennessee area. We're seeing the effects of climate change um, come to fruition um, as we've been talking about for so long. So um, I'm intrigued. Uh, I know that there's much more to learn, so I'm excited to be here. Well, Mary, we thank you. And I love Hands on Nashville. Tell Stephanie I said hello. I haven't seen her in a couple, couple of Will weeks. Will do. <laughs> thank you. All right, Kevin. Hi, Mr. Kevin. Hey, good morning. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Um, I'm just a concerned citizen. I am a former Peace Corps volunteer. I have a lot of nonprofit background. I was previously um, in banking and hospitality and uh, kind of got burnt out in the hospitality industry and really interested in uh, sustainability, climate change. I, I would like to return to the nonprofit sector. And glad Excellent. to be here, and uh, I'm hoping for uh, you know um, just to make some connections and, and see what comes down the road for me. Well, Kevin, you're in a good place, and now they're power washing, so I will be muted most of the morning. Gotta thank love you. a nine fifteen <laughs> start. So thank you so much, Kevin, and we definitely will make sure you get networked in here. You have you are amongst friends. All right, Laurel. Hi, good morning. I'm Laurel Creech and I am driving, so I apologize. I don't have my camera on this morning. Um, I'm the Assistant Director for Sustainability for the City of Nashville. I um, have been with the city doing sustainability for 11 years. Also, um, I'm Vice Chair of the National Parks Foundation and I'm on the board of the Civic Design Center and also Advisory Board with Everett. Everett's great organization, so thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Lowell, and be safe out there on the streets. Definitely keep your camera off. All right, Mr. Jones or Ms. Jones, E. Jones, who do we have? I'm Edna Jones. I'm with uh, Metro Sustainability Division, uh, coordinator for electric vehicles. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Edna, for being here. All right, Victoria. You're up next. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Sorry, I'm in my office, so no camera today. <laughs> and I just love trying to learn from everybody and what everybody does for sustainability. It always gives me good ideas after sitting down and getting to chat with people about what they're able to do. And I sometimes have things that I've been able to do in my work, just looking at making improvements with how we run things in the office, how we do our events that can help others. And also for my home life, big fan of like composting. And we have so many great resources here in Nashville for it. So really happy to be here with you all. Thank you so much, Dawn, for organizing this. It's gonna be awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much, Victoria, for being here. And and, and doing that double time there in the office and, 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 and training. I love it. Uh, all right, thank you. And it looks like we have one more, Donovan. Hey, Donovan. Hey, good morning, Dawn. How you doing? It's been a while. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Donovan. Uh, I'm with an organization called CTSI, and I'm here to learn about the thing to be first in the area and see how I can contribute. Thank you. And Don, thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Donovan is amazing. Been, it's been oh, 10 years, almost 10 years, Donovan. And I haven't seen you in a few. So it's good to have you here joining us today and, and representing your organization, all the work that you do as well. So have I missed anyone? I think I did get everyone. And so uh, now we want to go ahead and um, start our conversation. I've got a couple of things that I want to do, but um, the first thing I'd like to do is kind of open up with what we call a, uh, let me share my screen. And I'm going to ask you to annotate something, except for those who are driving. Um, if you can, I've got a whiteboard that I'm putting up. And I'm going to ask you to do one thing for us. If you could, in so many words, you can text it or email it, 
Define sustainability. What is sustainability to you? We'll give you a, a minute or so to, to put something out there. I think everyone can annotate. Because what do we want to do here? Do people know everyone... where to go to annotate? Oh, um, at the top, there should be a way. Um, okay, so I'm on the master server. If you have a box at the very top, you should see where it says whiteboard. There we go. So if you see the whiteboard icon, should have a little pencil that looks like this. You can click, Adam, you can also help me out here. How are you able to do that? He drew, he drew the square or the circle. You so you, when you go to view the top, options, you, and then, oh, yeah, sorry, King. <laughs> when you so, go to view yeah. options, it says annotate, and then you just draw. Or so you view, draw. <laughs> say that again, view options. And it just annotate is one of the pull downs. And annotate is the pull down, yes. So I've forgotten what it looks like on the, the, what I call the student version. For me, it's just like a box that comes out automatically and allows me to do text. There we go. And everyone doesn't have to do it, but for those of you, I'd like to just get an idea of where we are. So then our panelists can, can start this conversation and then we can also do an exchange because if you have some expertise in an area or if you have some projects, my goal today is to really see what we're currently working on and how we can start moving together in doing more for, for this great city and state. So what I'm seeing is practices that protect the environment and sustain natural resources. Sustainability is the ability to, let me minimize it, be maintained at a certain rate or level over time. All right, do we have a couple of others? To, be, to live in a way that, uh, that accords respect to the planet that we inhabit as guests. So true, so true. Everett is giving us his, his three Ps, yes. Victoria is writing as well, I love it. An environment that is healthy and able to thrive for the future. Sustainability is the ability of sustaining this generation while not impacting future generations negatively. Yes. Uh, Everett put in the three Ps, which he'll talk about. Um, I'm not gonna take his, 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 um, his, his, his fire, but he definitely has uh, three key things when you talk about sustainability that he will bring up in just a second. Sustainability is the ability to use resources in a circular fashion without the depletion of those resources in a way that is both equitably and financially responsible and accessible. So today's conversation, we are going to actually talk about that. And I thank you. And I see the heart. Love that. Uh, thank you for taking time to to type these things in. An environment that is healthy and able to thrive for the future. That's good. So if there are others, I'm gonna go ahead and save this. Great. And I'm going to stop the share now. We're gonna go ahead and have a conversation around these things because I think what has been put on this whiteboard is everything. And we wanna talk in detail about a lot of those. So let's let's start with uh, Everett. I'd like to ask for you to give us that acronym PPP. So what is it? What does that mean? And and what is sustainability? So I mean, this is just kind of the basis of what I was taught through uh, grad school and what I've carried through me with each of my positions is people, planet, profit. And so when we think of sustainability, it has that triple bottom line that each holds equal weight where it has to be beneficial for the planet, beneficial for people and beneficial for profit. And then those can break down in uh, different ways depending on the application. Um, and each of those things are measurable. 
um, which we can talk extensively about the many different measurement tools that are out there, both international and national to measure these things. Um, but ultimately that's how I define sustainability as is a triple bottom line approach. People play a profit. King and Jessica, do you have anything to add or anyone else? No, just, uh, I was reading a little about people planning a profit a couple of days ago on, on an HBS website and they had profit people than planet. So just their ordering made me chuckle where it was coming from. Like, oh, I see how you're prioritizing. Um, yeah, it's interesting when I was reading about this, it's all, it, it could also be said like uh, social, environmental and economy. Um, and that's why I like that uh, more generic version or, or definition of sustainability to be able to be maintained at a certain rate or level over time, over the long haul, because it's, it's, it's about more than one of those circles. It's about all of those circles intersecting uh, and impacting each other. So thank you for bringing that up, uh, Everett. Yeah, so I, I, true. Would, I would also ahead, like to throw out there too that there's just so many different versions of it, just like you all have said. And so some of the other ones is like a, a CSR uh, focus is like corporate social responsibility. And basically it translates to a similar focus or ESG, which is environmental social governance. Um, so everybody kind of uses different language to talk about this type of responsibility. Yeah. Is there anyone else? Thank you, Everett King and Jessica. Any other thoughts around the, the, the three P's? I'm old marketing head. So, you know, we learned the P's is the other way. Well, it's profit first. I, I, I've recovered. I've recovered. No one, no longer a marketer. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Well, I'd like to kind of to kind of start digging into what we have here locally. So uh, I love the fifty thousand foot level, but let's kind of look at some things locally. So, what would you say? And you can put this in the chat, or um, I'll put it out to the panelists first, and then we'll open it up for everyone. But what would you say are two to three key issues that we're seeing today? that must be addressed in our states or specifically our city or at large our state that we need to look at like sooner rather than later. So since 2010, we had the floods. I remember that. Tornadoes of 98, I was in that in a closet. Tornadoes of 2020, pandemic. So let's hear, what are the two to three top concerns from a sustainability standpoint here locally? I'll, I'll throw out my three, which I believe is, well, one of them is staring us in the face because Jessica is here. <laughs> uh, so that's one, <laughs> is transportation. Uh, another in my mind would be waste, um, which we can talk about that at a metro level, at a uh, like Davidson County level of what's happening around that. Um, and then the other would be climate resiliency when we're thinking about natural disasters, uh, both floods and tornadoes within Tennessee. That, that would be my answer. There's probably many others out there. Yeah, Kevin just put in a recognition of climate change as well, duly noted. Absolutely. Right. What I mean, some step, one, step one is, is admitting you have a problem, right, Don? <laughs> like, just admit it, then you can move forward. Um, but thank you, Everett, for that. Uh, at first, I got nervous. I'm like, I'm the problem staring you in the face. In the face. No, it, it is transportation. <laughs> no, I'm um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fine. But um, my three um, would be population growth, affordability, and mobility um, for, the, for my three. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with uh, population as a new person here, transportation. Uh, that's something I noticed when I when I moved here. I walk everywhere, and I don't see very many buses. Just just I, I enjoy walking, but that's just something I noticed. I don't see very many, uh, and and just access, right? So I a a big from something I'm really passionate about is just making sure that the entire community has access to those resources. So living in Boston, for example, I lived. I live near the uh, the rail line, and so I was able, you know, get to where I wanted to go very comfortably and easily. 
I don't see that here. And also when I was in Boston, I, I had the resources to live near a rail line. And so there were so many other communities that, that didn't. And it would take, in order for them to, to get to work, they'd have to leave you know, either exceptionally early or exceptionally late. And so as I'm thinking about transportation, the worst case, I can take an Uber, but not everybody has you know, the resources to, to be able to do that. Um, so along with transportation, there's population growth. And then I'm also curious about how the state is investing in, I think Evan, you said climate resiliency, and I, I'm thinking about energy usage. Excellent. Those are all great things. This whole population growth is going to get us, right? And Laurel put in adaptation, resilience, greenhouse gas reduction via renewables, electric vehicles, transit, active mobility, more trees, green space, protect and enhance our waterways. Absolutely. The great thing about our amazing country is there's more water underground than what we see above ground. And so being responsible to this land that we are renting is, is, is imperative. So yeah, very, very good. Very good conversation around that. There are definitely some, some things that we can work on today. So speaking of working on, what are some current projects? I'd like to hear from everyone. We're gonna open this up to everyone. What are some current projects that you are working on or recently completed that are noteworthy. I'm actually taking notes. You'll see me looking down. I'm taking notes because I want to make sure that we continue this conversation. Um, this is going to be something that we do on an ongoing basis. And thank you, Urban Green Lab. Love you to death. Dan Heller. Hey, Dan and I go back 15 years. <laughs> um, so that, that's a good thing, but I want to know what we're currently working on and what you, you, you've recently worked on so we can plug in. So I've, I see the Mayor Cooper's climate mitigation plan. Uh, Jacqueline, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Laurel's probably more qualified than I am given, given her role at, in local government, but um, I had the opportunity, I do have the opportunity to sit on that um, advisory committee and um, in the process of co-authoring the adaptation report, which is kind of a companion piece to, to this plan. But I, I encourage everybody to look at it and um, we'll be doing stakeholder engagement, hopefully later on um, in this year to, to get input. And so stay tuned for that. But it outlines um, opportunities for mitigation and in, in, in big buckets such as um, energy, bu building and energy, transportation, waste, <clears throat> Um, and water, well, natural resources and waterfalls in that. So um, I think we could have a whole webinar on it, but I encourage everyone to check it out. And it's, it's hyper local and it's super current. I think it was released in January. Thank you, Jacqueline. That's such a good point. Um, so we've got the link for those of you who are interested in learning more about that. The PDF is there in the chat and we will have that available in the uh the recording that we send over to you as well just in case you don't you don't have a chance to grab it are there any other current projects or newly released projects jessica i just saw you put something in there you want to talk to us about that tra that transportational plan transportation yeah. plan I would love to. Um, I think that this is something that people really don't know about, but we all should know more about it. Um, this is the Greater Nashville Regional Council, otherwise known as the GNRC. They are a council of governments of Middle Tennessee. Uh, uh, they have a board of regional mayors that guide their work. They actually do a lot more work, Everett, to your point about waste. Uh, they also look at waste in the region to help um, facilitate that, but this plan is the regional transportation plan. It allocates $10.5 billion for the next 25 years in our region uh, for transportation projects. So the money that's coming in from the federal government and the state government, the GNRC then um, flows out according to this plan. Okay, that is approved and adopted by the area mayors. 
the GNRC is a public entity, um, so you are allowed to go to those meetings and, and give comment and look at what they're doing. I encourage you to go to that site, look at their transportation plan. It goes through 2045, I think, at this point, um, and it's going to show you projections of population growth and where that's going to be and where the congestion is going to go and what what projects are coming down the pike. Um, so if uh, if you want to dig more into transportation, I highly recommend you get familiar with the GNRC and their transportation board and the regional transportation plan. Jessica, thank you for that, because part of what we were going to do at the end of this call was start gathering those resources of ways that we can show up. And, and you just gave us a, a, good, a good way to start the conversation. Even if we're early on our journey or pretty seasoned, thank you. All right, there's a risk and resilience program that Jacqueline put in there as well. Um, that's with the uh, government. What do we need to know about that one, Jacqueline? Yeah, I don't. I don't mean. I don't. I don't want to talk any more than I. Um, I just want to provide some resources. Good. On. But this is more on a state level. So TDEC is a state agency. And so we, you know, there's a big divide between urban and rural and what those communities need. And, and um, we're super cognizant of that. So our Office of Policy and Sustainable Practices has a risk and resilience program that helps lift up rural uh, counties, particularly at risk and get them um, trying to lift them from distress to at risk uh, and up the ranks. And so this is all about really natural disaster preparedness in Waverly and Humphreys County is a perfect example of that. Um, they, they were caught really flat footed in terms of their, um, their, their mitigation and FEMA plan. And in order to be able to get FEMA dollars, you have to have that planning in place. And so you have to have that due diligence before the disaster happens. A lot of communities just um, don't have the staffing to do robust planning of that sort. And so we come in, we help and provide capacity and technical assistance so that they're uh, better prepared. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, usually it's just a, a template that we're able to give them to just say, hey, you, you don't have a blank canvas. This is um, a starting point and you can edit accordingly, but it goes a long way in helping these communities um, be better prepared for these, as they called it, a thousand year flood. Uh, it wasn't a waterway, the entire watershed flooded. Uh, so, so yeah, that's um, some resources there. And on the GNRC front, there's another um, economic, you know, to, to profit, people and, and um, planet, this is on economic development, which you have to, you have to illustrate that and um, in dollars and cents to make the, the sustainability case. And so I can put that resource in the chat as well. Yeah, I would love you to put that in there as well, Jacqueline, because she's, she's brought up a really good point. And we're gonna get to, I, I saw a couple of things in the chat I wanna get back to. Everett, definitely we want you to talk about um, your resource and how this, the thing that you're doing, bringing all these sustainability um, entities together, including some of our strong anchors, Urban Green Labs, who's been doing this for a while. We wanna be able to expand our reach and being a person who is from a rural county, it is very different. And I'm 30 minutes away from Waverly. And so when that happened, I actually have, yeah, they, they had some makeshift call centers, Jacqueline. I have a family member that was washing clothes for 20 families. Um, we, we definitely have to talk about what we can do better. Um, so, so I wanna ask, what can we do better? We've identified things that we can do, projects that we're currently working on. What can, we know we are Tornado Alley, okay? We know we have more water than we have land sometimes. So what do you recommend we do? And I'll, I'll start with our panelists. What do, you, what, what do we need to do to address the disaster relief space? Let's start with just that one. Because that's something we have on a consistent basis now. We have at least one flood or one fire. <laughs> I, I would love to kind of put this idea forward to you. When I have so, and this kind of tacks onto what Jacqueline just said, um, 
is that when, when I have sold sustainability projects in the past, depending on whatever position I was in, it, it really is that profitability is first when trying to sell a project. And um, when thinking about that uh, triple bottom line, people plan a profit, the, pe the people in planet part <clears throat> are more soft benefits to some people that you pitch to rather than all three being hard benefits. And so I think when we think of climate resiliency and disaster relief, um, there is that kind of standard pipeline of how uh, traditionally things get done and where you present something with profitability and then you move forward within that silo that you're uh, supposed to be operating in. I think that all these solutions we have to think outside our silos. We have to reach across silos. We have to think creatively about, okay, well, who does have these resources? Who does have this power to leverage this change or set up climate resiliency projects? Um, and rather than think of it in a monetary value, think of it as who has the leverage to do this? And it doesn't matter if they work for the government. It doesn't matter if they're for a private business or nonprofit or community group. Um, so I guess that would be my piece is it's all about getting rid of those silos and a monetary pipeline of getting projects done and thinking about the whole thing as a system and how to leverage uh, people's resources outside of your own silo. All right, that's good. Evan, and that's, that's what your, your organization is about, bringing everyone together and bringing all the entities together. And breaking down the walls of those silos because we know that model does not work, especially with the level of work we need across these 95 counties. Now, Mary, I want to go to something you put in the chat. Uh, VOAD yeah. is a coalition for nonprofits. Could you talk to us a little bit about VOAD and, and, and what we need to do? Yeah, um, so the VOAD um, happened uh, it was a coalition of nonprofits that, um, you know, are engaged in disaster relief and activating volunteers. And it disbanded, I believe, in 2017 because there weren't any disasters happening since the 2010 flood, um, you know. But um, when the tornadoes hit, um, Hands On Nashville saw the need to um, activate um, these nonprofit organizations for better communication um, so that when disasters happen, which we project that they will um, in much more uh, greater speed than uh, they have in the past, um, that we need to be um, communicating and prepared to react. Um, and so um, as we've seen in the past year, um, that is definitely true with the Christmas bombings, um, with the spring flood and with COVID. Um, and so they're very active um, and they're, the chair is Lori Shinton from Hands on Nashville. Um, but what I would love to see um, happen is to be, which is a very much a visionary approach right now because it's still very much in its inception, um, to be much more preventative than reactive. Um, and so right now, I think they're very much in the reactive stage um, because of just simply um, all of the disasters that have happened over the past year and a half. Um, but if there aren't any disasters that are happening, um, you know, in the next couple of months and years, I would love to see the preventive um, stage of that as well. All right, so let's sit with that because that's exactly what we want to get to. In 2022, I would love to have a collaborative together that ultimately turns into a collective impact initiative that addresses all of this for every, every marginalized community, every rural community, every urban community, every uh, person with differences. So let's, let's talk about what these preventative methods should look like and should entail. We've already talked about, we have the people. We, we, we obviously have the examples because uh, 2018 to 2021 has been quite a whirlwind. Um, so, so what is it going to take with this room of, of collective voices to get some movement in this preventative space? Um, yeah, Don, if I may. Uh, yes, ma'am. Tech, tap into this. Um, I, my, individually, the question, I was thinking pragmatic and preventative also. So, Mary, that was a great segue to to this, but from the transportation standpoint, if you're looking at infrastructure, 
and development. Um, well, development could just be, you know, buildings also, but we've got to start looking at how we're building, where we'll, where we'll, we are building, the materials we're using. Um, because what, what we're creating with all of this development is a, a lot of pavement that doesn't absorb water. Um, we're seeing a lot of extraneous flooding, especially out uh, in the outer ring of the county because of all of the development, the residential development is uprooting all of the trees and all of the absorbent ground, which creates ripe and fertile ground for, uh, you guessed it, more flooding. So. Um, in my neighborhood specifically, they they want to do more development, but there's already runoff issues, and um, the the side of the hill keeps kind of sliding down right into the road, which creates more um, safety issues. So I think that really looking intentionally about policies, land use, zoning, looking at those types of things, looking at maybe even creating policies on what type of asphalt we're allowed to use and lay down um, in in the city. Um, it was just kind of where my brain was going. Yeah, Jessica, I, that was beautiful. Everett, go ahead. Bouncing off of that too, I mean, to, to kind of paint a picture, these things are all linked, right? So transportation to land use to water quality, for instance, there's a line of thinking there <clears throat> where if we're primarily uh, single driver motor vehicles, right? And we have uh, impervious pavement as the majority of our built environment and uh, we get a lot of water. And then if you link those things together, pollution to runoff to water quality, everything is linked together. And so it's kind of seeing that big systems map. So I, I just wanted to amen Jessica, because yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Any other comments on that before I, uh, I'm going to ping the king because I've got something as we talk about this connectivity with this work and things as simple as runoff. I, I really want us to get into the equity conversation. Where would I be as the diversity person and the equity uh, uh, entity in our organization and really uh, part of the community? I am an East Nashvilleian, 37207. After the floods and the um, tornadoes of 2010, my property value doubled and gentrification took place. So King, I'd like for us to talk about the role of, 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 of racial inequalities and things that you've seen, maybe a couple of examples and some things that maybe we should watch out for here locally. And especially as a new transplant here, I'd definitely love to get your voice in that. Yeah, I, I apologize. There's a lot of construction going on outside. So um, if you give me maybe 30 seconds, I'll change rooms and I'll, I'll be able to, to hop back in the conversation. Absolutely. So we're, we're talking, oh, here comes someone else. Hey, here comes Jennifer. So what we're about to do now and welcome Jennifer. And I also want to welcome the executive director of the Center for Nonprofit Management, Ms. Terry Hughes. Yes, my boss. Yes, yes. Tell them how great I am. Thank you. No, uh, glad to have her here and to also here to add to the conversation. Hey, Terry. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Just wanted to drop in and oh my goodness, there's my walking partner from earlier today. Hi, Judy. How funny is that? <laughs> I'm glad to see you guys and just mostly um, a fly on the wall, but um, you're, you're, I love this getting out of the silos mentality and bringing the equity conversation into all of these, um, uh, you know, disasters because we've seen, we've seen that be a big issue. So I'm mostly listening. All right. Well, we're, we're so thankful to have you here. And uh, Jennifer, thank you for joining the conversation. Welcome, welcome. This is being recorded. So as you know, we had a couple of people have had to drop off for other meetings. Um, so we're definitely going to keep this conversation going. Um, King is changing rooms, and we're going to talk a little bit, um, spend a few minutes talking about the equity piece. Because when we talk about rural versus urban, and as a native Nashvilleian, until I moved out of county, I didn't realize how privileged I was until I lived. And so I really want us, um, as we start thinking about the things that Everett and, 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 and Jessica and Mary and others have said policy, 
zoning, land use, water quality. Shall I go back to policy? I really want us to, to look at what we can do and what we should do uh, to really move the needle. Because we've got a lot of great people doing great things. And being in the nonprofit space, they love to say, oh yeah, you guys are doing great work. But what I'm looking to do is have the government in, have the construction companies in. So Donovan, having your organizations and your peers um, in on this, um, having the nonprofits, of course, there and with the access to go and do this real, real work. Because in the rural spaces, we have a, we have a lot to do. And because I live in a, a community that is really 70% rural, a county that's 70% rural, it's very different. And so you talk about transportation, Jessica. We have a bus line that goes up and down one street. That's it. <laughs> so it's something that simple that can impact us. So um, King, are you ready? I think it's getting there. And I'm gonna put this out um, to everyone, but I know he definitely is gonna talk about some things. Um, when we think about our ecosystem and different projects that highlight racial equity within sustainability, what does that look like in Nashville? Racial equity as it relates to sustainability I mean, in Nashville. I'll, I'm not the expert on this event, but I just will throw it out there as an example. And I would love for someone more educated on this to speak about it. But the uh, possible and now rejected expansion of the landfill in North Nashville uh, in a uh, historically Black neighborhood, that would be something that I would love to kind of, that, that's something that I see as a direct connection to this uh, for sure. Everett did his homework. That's where I grew up. 37218, 3231 LaGrange Drive. Used to smell the dump every day. Go for rats running around like candy. It was crazy. So I know King is connecting to audio, but I really want us to talk about this because this is a this is a huge issue. And then when you I'll, when you I'll say I'll say go for ahead, my Jessica. Part, Ron, thank you. I'll say for my part, um, <clears throat> I grew up near a dump too, and only in Cheatham County. Just Put, throw that out there. Don't, we used to call it Dump Road. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, social equity in, in terms of transit and transportation is uh, the, the way we are built, the way Nashville and our region is built, uh, as you were talking about rural um, areas and transportation are a mismatch, right? But um, <clears throat> we are basically forced to own a personal vehicle in order to participate in the economy, okay? So if you cannot afford a personal vehicle and maintain it so you can get to work and back regularly, reliably, then you cannot even dream of participating in the economy, even though it's booming, even though it, there seems to be enough to go around. But if you can't participate, you don't get to party. And if you can't, if you're not mobile, you don't have that access. That is your hurdle because then you can't access education. You can't access training, you can't access jobs, you can't access healthcare or, you know, even going to the park, getting your kids to um, their practices. They can't access after school jobs. I mean, it is a challenge. So that, that, that's where transit and mobility really comes into play. Thank you, Jessica. So King is back and we've been talking about Everett, Jessica and all of, uh, of us here have been talking about you know, racial equity within sustainability in the Nashville space. And I know King, you come here with a wealth of experience where you've seen some of this in other places. So I wanted to, you to talk about uh, some of the narratives that are even outside of Nashville that could, could give us some, some pause and, and, and possibly some fuel to start working and thinking differently about how we address sustainability here and not be, like Mary said, reactive, but more preventative and proactive. So King, I'm gonna go ahead and let you chat a little bit about that and then we'll come back to some things that we can do. Just so you know, King, um, one of the big, the big markers that Everett introduced, which was one that directly impacted me as a kid was the North Nashville dump. Um, 
Yeah, it was, and, and, and also another thing, Everett, another thing that I live with, we have three um, of our penal our prisons down the street from me as well. So I live through two miles away from the Tennessee prison for women and four from River Bend and D. Berry. Go ahead, be, King. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You have to unmute, King. <laughs> Whoops, I was unmuted on my phone, thank you. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is who's a part of the conversation? Right, so I, I look at the room today, and I'm I'm super stoked, super excited to be here. But at the same time, I'm also not from the area. I think there's a uh, it's necessary in order to have equitable solutions to have folks from the community who are who are from here. And from what I understand, Nashville is to be 30% black. And so to have that representation, to have those voices that's the only way we're going to be able to have the solutions that serve everybody. That's, that's going to be number one. And, you know, it, it can be challenging because of, of the kind of network that many of us could be a part of, having to find those right voices. But doing that extra work will ensure that everybody is part of a collective solution. Uh, all too often, uh, we think about, and I, and I say the collectively, you know, the, the way that, we generally ha have been operating. Uh, the solutions don't don't positively affect everybody. So if we're doing, if we're if we are um, uh, renovating a place, or, or, or if we are developing a, a new area, we're not bringing in everybody. And so one one thing that is super helpful for me is thinking about the curb cut effect and. That is making sure that solutions affect the most vulnerable of us in a community. It's ensuring that the idea came from uh, the Bay Area, and you know, it was it had to do with actually cutting a curb so people who were in chairs could access the curb. And at first, you know, there were some uh, issues around it because people didn't get why we needed to completely change how transportation and mobility function within a community. But once it happened, so many people are benefiting from that curb cut, from those who have just recently had a knee injury, to those who are using strollers, to those who just, it's just easier for them to, to walk up a, a, a slope as opposed to stepping up a huge curb. So really having that mindset and having that perspective is, uh, could, be, could be really helpful. And then the next thing that comes to mind, as Jessica was talking about, um, as she was talking about uh, impervious concrete, right? And, and I automatically would think about where I live in, in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And after the, there was a flood in, I think, 2011. And the, the downtown area, the, the city area, uh, that got fixed fast, right? They, there were generators up. People were able to, as closely as possible, resume their normal lives. Whereas those who lived a bit further out, those who were lower income, generally speaking, it took months, if not years, in order for them to have some semblance of the life before the flood. And so that, those are the couple of things that come to mind. You know, we're, we're talking about uh, being proactive because being reactive really means being reactive to those who have the resources and those who are, are, are proximate to power. Uh, and, and, and so being proactive can ensure, can help ensure anyway, that those who are most vulnerable aren't suffering, aren't suffering disproportionate consequences of those in power. Excellent. Thank you so much, King. Does anyone else have any ideas around this, this uh, of what we can do, you know, with, with this, I don't want to call it a problem, but with this system. Uh, around access, around equity for the marginalized, and I call them the ruralized. Dawn. Yes, Jennifer. Hi, Don. This is Jennifer. Hi. I am um, colleagues with Edna Jones, who is on the call, and Laurel Creech, who was on earlier and unfortunately had to drop off, but is thankful for participation. And I was on via phone before I came on via video. Um, and let me put my video on. Sorry for being so rude. Um, but 
Laurel, when she was uh, when she was dropping off, also wanted to add or wanted to have me add that the climate mitigation plan that was mentioned earlier in the conversation is going to have public engagement later this year, hopefully this fall, and that there's going to be a specific emphasis within that public engagement process around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that you know one of the biggest things we can do in terms of John your point about like how do we operationalize and make it actionable is for this document, which we hope will be a guiding document for our city around climate um, mitigation as we move forward, that, you know, we can all beat the bushes, right? Just like get, like what King was saying, like get the people at the table. Like this is the, the time for public engagement and, um, and input and making sure that folks' voices are reflected and that the plan really <clears throat> meets the needs of and reflects the interests of everybody in our community, um, regardless of geography, race, income, age, all of those things. So I think that's something we all can do um, in, in the near term, you know, to, to begin bringing those voices to the table. And we also, I think, have to make sure that once we get those voices at the table, that we make sure that all the input that's given is not just sort of, this is not a word, but tokenalized or just sort of like, great, we got public input, but we're still going to do what we already decided we were going to do before we got the public input. So how do we make sure that that public input, which we hope is diverse and rich um, and, and kind of comprehensive, is legitimately reflected in the plan, not only in the plan, but in the actions that are taken as a result of the plan. Oh my goodness, Jennifer, you are right. Cause that whole, yeah, tokenalize, yes, ma'am. We, we have put that, we're gonna put that in the business book because it's a part of tokenism, okay? And you're right, that's what we'd like to do is get that one or two little example, throw a metric up in the air and say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Funder, look at what I did. We've gotta get away from that. And you are exactly right. So I'm looking forward, uh, Jennifer, um, to really, um, having this space and anytime, and this is for everyone on the call and anyone listening to the video, if you have initiatives and you need bodies or you need representation and you have events, whether they're webinars or things that are feet on the ground, please let CNM know. My email, dawn at cnm.org, let me know. We've got representatives from Hands on Nashville here. Let us know because I really want to make sure that we do our part. Be responsive to that feedback. Ding, ding, ding. You're right. You're right. And um, I, I do want to, 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 to bring voice to someone on this call that I like really, really, really am excited to have here. Jacqueline. Did she go? Did she come? Oh, yes. Hi. <laughs> Can you do me a favor and just go ahead and let everybody know who you are and what you do? Because you and I have to connect on some things too. So this is all about connecting. So Everett, Jacqueline, Jacqueline, Everett. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Jacqueline, thank, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm sorry, I can only join for like a little bit here. Um, but I'm Jackie, I'm with Urban Green Lab here in Nashville. Um, I've been with the organization for about two months now. I run our Sustainable Workplaces program. So that's the Nashville Sustainability Roundtable and the lab certification program. Um, so if anyone's interested in hearing more about how to make workplaces more sustainable, we work with nonprofits, we work with government offices, companies, really anyone who is in a workplace in Nashville, even schools. Thank you. And the reason why I have Jackie and their team here is because this is the way we can actually operationalize this work because we've got all the players we've got government we have their education we have businesses uh, next i'm going to get a few builders out here that's a whole nother thing but at least through jackie's organization i have one, one developer that's a really dear friend dan heller love him to death tell him hi. uh <laughs> that is is about it and understands where we are so judy said Yes, about youth. There's a lot of work around youth, and I appreciate a lot of the conversation we're having because we know that there's great work to do. Are there any other people that we need to bring to this work that is not currently in this space? I'm thinking educational, higher educational initiatives 
and, and, and spaces. Because as a professor, it's funny, we were talking about concrete. I have a student that did her project on uh, sustainable concrete in another country. It was a global plan, but she was thinking about that. And now hearing the conversation here about work that we can do, that's something we could look into here. We've mentioned a lot about policy, and I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention <clears throat> I'm the board treasurer for Tennessee Conservation Voters. And so um, when we talk about the policy conversation, there's a lot there's a lot there, like historically of how people have been lobbying, really a singular person, Stuart Clifton, uh, on behalf of the environment and outside of the environment um, at the state legislature. Um, so there's a bunch of history there, and, and that might be something that we want to loop people in on, is, is my point, is the policy aspect. Yeah. Good segue, Everett. Let's talk about some of the policies that are impacting us now that we need to be privy to. I, I always do a search, and, and literally, I only was able to find one that was, but I know you guys are the experts. So tell me, what should we get behind start lobbying for, et cetera. What are you saying? Jessica, I'm sure you know some spaces too. <laughs> this transportation. Anyone? Well, I'm always so I'm always so simple about it. We just need dedicated funding for transit so we can get things moving to King's point earlier. He rarely sees buses and that's sadly because it's inadequately funded. So uh you know natural a natural outgrowth is that of that is inadequate service. Um we're already at capacity at, at our, um, you know, where the buses are parked overnight. So at our um, garages, the bus garages, right? And so just to move that garage to a bigger facility is gonna cost millions. So, but we can't do that because we don't have dedicated funding. So it, it it's, you know, chicken or egg, but um, at this point it's funding for transit. Donovan, Donovan. Yeah. go ahead. Um, one of the things that I continue to see that's missing in a lot of our conversations has to deal with, I'm gonna to go to the P and the people side. And uh, especially when we were talking about equity. And so what, what we're working on, the group that I, um, that I lead, uh, we're looking at how to, bring economic development into these communities to address the issues that they're facing so that they're creating products and services just like other communities in the city. Just duplicate what other people are doing. And so when we bring more economic development into the community and we have businesses that are designed to be successful, and so we bring the investor capital to the table. We provide the training. We train them leveraging an apprenticeship model where we're paying them to learn to do something extremely well, train them to become successful entrepreneurs and pay them to learn to do that. They are going to hire people locally. When their local economy is doing well, their neighborhood is doing well, they're not gonna travel as much. They're gonna spend more time. That's what people do. You tend to stay closer. You work there, you deepen those relationships. And so let's leverage dollars to drive economic development. And let's also bring the objectors to the table because we know that when we increase academic performance, that means that we need fewer trial attorneys. We need fewer trial judges. We need fewer prisons. Let's pay these and help these individuals as a part of economic development because we don't want them to become an issue. And let's help them to pivot their business so that it's driving the outcomes that we want. And one of the places we need to start is in education. And so if you look at Nashville, Nashville has public schools that always do well, always do well. And they have a pipeline. How in the same city, with the same leadership, we have schools that always do poorly and schools that always do well, paying the same amount per student, same amount per student, same leadership. 
you, we have a lottery system where if you live next to me and you win, you are on a pathway for success. Because I lose, I end up in a school with a graduation rate of 64%. Where do you think I'm gonna go? I'm probably gonna go to prison. I'm headed towards poverty. And so the solutions exist. Our problem is we live in this, you know, winner take all world. For me to win, you have to lose. Well, let's rise that tide for everybody. Economic development improves outcomes for everybody. We know that every time that a child graduates high school, that's an additional $500,000 in economic development for that community. We know what it's been research, it's been research, it's been research. We don't have to ask people a whole lot more questions. What changed from five years ago, 10 years ago? Yes, we had an epidemic. I got that there more poor people, but we don't have to ask for a whole lot. We don't need more research, people. We really don't. We know the things that work. I'm, uh, yesterday I was in a conversation with the mayor of Brownsville. We are looking at three initiatives in his city and we're gonna reach out to Memphis and also to Jackson. One is a healthcare initiative, one is an education initiative and the other is a construction initiative. The construction initiative, we're looking at an Australian company that does hemp blocks, hemp cement blocks. We don't have to cut down trees. We don't have to do this. We're going to build using hemp. Very, very sustainable. We're going to build a community center within the community. They will have access to a commercial kitchen, a indoor grow area where they will own portions of the grow area. They'll be able to run their business in the commercial kitchen. They'll have access to a gym and stuff that people have in other communities. They will own the facility after 10 years. The community will own the facility free and clear after 10 years. People are getting paid a stipend as an apprentice. A portion of their stipend is going to be invested. We're going to force them to start doing well, not just doing financial literacy. Financial literacy is great, but you have to do it. We force adults to do it. Let's force it. Let's, let's get investment solutions in their communities. There are tools out there that people are already doing. That. Let's duplicate those things. Sorry about that. I, that's my focus. Uh, we have a nonprofit, and our nonprofit also has a for profit asset management subsidiary. Um, the for profit, its goal is to raise capital and bring investor capital to the table. We have very large issues. We love to spend a whole lot of money and we focus on activities, and not outcomes. We declared the war on poverty in 1964 and we spent over $30 trillion pre pandemic and had more people living in poverty. Let's stop this. We know what to do, but let's do it in such a way that I'm not saying, hey, John, uh, you gotta give me what you have in order for me to do well. No, Don, we're, we're gonna create a business. You can invest in the business. When the business does well, you're gonna do well, I'm gonna do well. Others are going, we're gonna hire people, we're gonna pay them. It works. It works over here in the same city. Over here it works. Let's make it work over here. Let's make it a priority. Last thing I will say is think lemonade stands. Have you ever seen an unsuccessful lemonade stand? Six and seven year olds know how to run successful businesses. Six and seven year olds run successful businesses. We set them up for success and then we tell them, ah, oh, you don't know anything about running a business, go work for somebody. We're the crazy ones. We are the crazy ones. Six and seven year olds can run successful businesses. Why can't we run successful businesses in these communities? I'm sorry, <laughs> taking up all that. I'm sorry about that. Oh, Donovan, that is great. You know, that's why I love you. We're yummy, it's yummy because we have the answers. And so that is the million dollar question for me. When we know the answers and we have examples, why is it that the it city of Nashville can't start, I guess, start the ball rolling? Like, what is it going to take for all of us to really, and it's that silo mentality that Everett alluded to earlier, um, 
why can't we start now? Like what is preventing us from doing this now? The livable wage, the um, building a community from within the community, allowing them to learn. And Donovan and I both know my children are entrepreneurs and they will all be entrepreneurs. And as a college professor, I have told my kids, they do not have to go to college. Why? Because that model doesn't necessarily work for them, but entrepreneurship does. And so, I mean, just a different way, being creative for them to get a livable wage, for them to, to have more means and to be able to do the, the, uh, the work to dismantle some stuff. My 14 year old is the one who is the, um, the Black Lives Matter, the anti-semantic uh, uh, protester, she's that chick. She gets out for every community and doesn't care, LGBTQI plus, Asian American hate crime stuff, she is sounding off. So to your point, Donovan, and I love this because as we move into this last segment, I want you to think about what is preventing us from doing what we know can be done and we have the resources. We have the people, we have our planet, you know, to, we're trying not to kill it or harm it more. Um, and we know that there are policies and we know that there's profit. So what, what are our next steps? How do, how do we make that happen, Donovan? How can we make what Donovan's doing in Brownville real for us in Nashville? Jessica and I have ties to Cheatham County. Jessica, if you ever uh, know a bail, they're kin to me. And I'm so sorry, all of us are not created equal. That's okay. We're the bail family, right? Good iron, iron men and, 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 and farmers. All that. What can we do, folks? I will say two things that I would love to chime in on. Um, okay. One is uh, what Donovan said about uh, like the knowledge is already out there. I think that that's absolutely key that the knowledge is already out there and it's about connecting cross silos, just like we said. So that's number one. And number two, I would say, as far as a policy standpoint, that's something that I see with Tennessee conservation voters that has huge opportunity. I mean, tennis, TCV has been in this space since the 70s. And back when there was no sustainability, it was conservation. And over the decades, right, that conversation has changed. And so TCV, and I'm kind of a part of this with the board, is trying to expand it and modernize it into a more sustainability focused, which means bringing in those voices. So I would say people are very underrepresented at the state level legislature. Um, so from a policy standpoint, that is a direct need of getting people uh, educated on how to get involved in a state level legislature, how, how, how can they get their voices heard, which is actually pretty easy. Um, just we need people to educate and like communicate what those things are. <laughs> so that's something that we're working on with TCV, but that would be one of my answers is like, populations across Tennessee are vastly underrepresented at the state legislature, especially around environmental and social issues. Yes. Excuse me, Don, 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 can I jump in? Um, yep, Donovan. Jacqueline, I just heard about what your organization does, and I would love to partner with you and others on this call to go after $25 million in TANF dollars that the Department of Human Services has available. And we will build out your model in a community. Let's pick an underserved, underinvested community. We will build it out, but build it out for sustainability. So that means that after the three years, and even before the end of the three years, we have investor capital coming in. We will create businesses that are learning. You're going to train them to go into companies, into homes, and to ensure that they meet those standards and it will become a service. They're going to charge companies to provide these services. So we're going to create businesses and job opportunities within this, let's pick a community. And we have the abstract has to be submitted by the end of this month. Uh, and our model is our model. It's apprenticeships. We're gonna pay the people to learn. You have the program, let's pay them to learn. 
And then let's get into star businesses that they're doing this. And while we're working on policies, we're bringing revenue into the community and we're helping to change lives and also address um, the sustainability piece as well. If you'd like to do that. And yeah. anybody else on, um, on the call. Donovan, that's beautiful. Put um, put it out there if you if you have the, what your need is, what your ask is, because I, I agree with you. Uh, the Urban Green Lab is a perfect um, uh, partner in this collaborative, and there are others on this call that fit into to what you're doing. So let us know how we can support you, Donovan. And just a clarifying and question, it's, Donovan: it's, Is it the those who can participate in the apprenticeship? What sort of um, education requirements are there? It's whatever education requirements uh, Jacqueline has. And if there's a way for us to take what she has and create a, a separate um, component that's geared to another group, let's explore that as well. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's really up to us to make the determination, but she has something that already works. Let's leverage what she has and build additional services and supports for people who aren't ready for what she has. Let's get them ready and let's pay them so that they are ready so that they'll take advantage of what she has to offer. And what are some of the you know, um, ecosystems that surround what she has to offer? And let's identify those and those are additional um, economic development opportunities. I love that. I just, I, I'm new, so I, I'll look more into the urban lab. The, the spirit of my question is just to ensure that those who don't have a college degree, maybe even high school degree, are still able to participate in, in, the, in the vision that you're creating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Donovan, they don't have to have a college degree, right? For, for what we are, what I'm working on, our goal is to get to kids. Remember I said I love lemonade stands. Okay, and so um, what, I, what we are working with, with has nothing to do with people having a degree or not having a degree. If you need one, we're going to work with you to help you to get it, okay? Because this is something that's necessary, but there are other opportunities as well. And so the, the key is to create the opportunities, but do it closer, bring it closer into the communities and let them own it. We have a lot of dollars that flow through the community, but that's what it does, it flows through. And it's usually in the form of we're delivering service. And we really don't see a whole lot of changes in the community, but the dollars that flow through changes outcomes in other places. And so all that I'm saying is let's bring the dollars in and let's keep more of it in the communities. Let some out. Let them out because people are going to invest and those investors are going to get a return on their investments. And so I'll show you, we could in Tennessee get the graduation rate up to 99% in 10 years if we wanted to. I say that because there are already high schools in Tennessee with graduation rates of 99%. So we already know what to do. So that's why I can say it. <laughs> to choices. And so, um, Lynn, let's and, uh, we'll throw something together, send it out to the rest of the group uh, with some details, if that works. Yeah, Donovan, that sounds great. I've just put my email in the um, chat. We can get together with some of our other program managers and our executive director and see what kind of partnership we can have. Excellent. And Donovan, uh, we'll put this out there at CNM. If you need to have a, a follow-up convening, meaning a conversation with the, everyone who's on this call that may fit into that, because I know when you're going for bigger funding and you need those extra supports that you're talking about, we at CNM would be willing to convene that for you and possibly bring in those other pieces that you need. Okay. Yes, and, and this has to be a collaborative effort. Absolutely. It has to be a collaborative effort. Absolutely. Right. And I think that's a requirement for the funds. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're really, so this is a perfect timing um, since it's due by the end of the month, right, Donovan? 
Yes, the end of the month. Yes. For the planning, for the planning grant piece. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, for those not familiar, the, the there's a planet. So there's a abstract view by the end of the month that says, "Here's what we're going to do." Uh, they're going to go through and say, "Okay, we want these six, seven uh, projects across the state." Uh, there are two in Middle Tennessee, two in West Tennessee, two in um, East Tennessee, and there's one. So there's a total of seven, and there's one that the um, commissioner is going to select. So DHS is going to select. So there's a total of seven for, and they get twenty-five million dollars each. There's also five million that's going to go um, solely for evaluation, and so a and, and several entities will get paid to evaluate because the goal is to reduce dependence on DHS services. And one of the conversations that I've had with the commissioners around how to implement pay for success as a part of a sustainability um, funding tool that will help to accomplish some of the things that he's focused on and the film that we need to bring in um, education, corrections, um, commerce, and others. Excellent. So, Thanks, Donovan. So, Don, um, yes, uh, need your need you to be a part of the team. And Absolutely. On here. And Donovan, my number has changed. I'll send you. I'll put it in the chat. This is my personal cell for anyone here. Even if you you don't know that you want to be involved, go ahead and shoot me information, Donovan. You know, I've got you on the correction side as well. So, uh, looking forward to it. All right, this is great. This is exactly how this is supposed to work. And I am just elated. And I have a couple of other questions here. Really want to, um, to say, are there other things? To found? It seems like we found a project um, that we can start working on and get excited about and actually make a true impact sooner rather than later. So I'm excited about that. Um, are there other needs out here? Donovan just shared a big one and we, we've created one collaborative. And I'm going to say we're all in that bucket. So um, are there some other needs in your respective agencies that, that may need some, some, some resources or some letters of support or some hands and brains? Anyone? I think it's important for me to throw out there for Network for Sustainable Solutions. Uh, we have a registration um, where we're kind of pulling everybody in the state, as I said, that's doing good sustainability work. I'm going to put our website in the chat and um, just as we're talking about collaboration and it takes a community, uh, this is that an action of, of the community sharing this tool around for people to register so we know who's out there. Currently we've got uh, 59 registered entities with us and about 26 of them have made a listing on our website and that spans from businesses, community organizations, we've got some in Chattanooga that have already registered. So I would just encourage everybody, if you know an entity, it doesn't matter if they're what, what their label is, if they're doing sustainability work, um, we'd love to have them register. Excellent. Thank you, Everett. Thank you so much. Um, so we, we've touched these last uh, 15. I'm, I'm going to be cognizant of everyone's time because we just talked through the the. Um, the, the break that I had in there. So I guess we will be ending early, but I wanted to, um, to, to note a couple of things. We we've talked about equity. We've talked about uh, the, the, the greater things that we could do here in Nashville um, to address you know, our, our problems with sustainability. So we talked about everything from the land, uh, water quality, zoning, and policy. I really want us to, to in this last say 10, 15 minutes, um, cause I wanna give you that 15 minute for that break you didn't get on the end. I mean, these last 10 or 15 minutes, I'd really like for us to round robin and kind of talk about some things from a policy standpoint or some basic needs within your space. Jessica, I definitely want you to talk about what's next in transportation for us. Um, um, King, if there are some other things, I know Donovan just gave that slam dunk, you two will definitely be in touch but if there are some other things that we need to think about from a, um, a equity and, and, and justice lens, because as we move from charity to justice, it's, 
important for us as nonprofits to understand we're no longer in the bless your heart zone. We're in the go, go do something and be on fire. And then Everett, um, you, you, you've just stated, we need to, to get this network going. So when, what do we need to do to ensure we keep these conversations fresh? So I will tell you this before I change to my phone, um, we are looking to do sustainability talks at least once a quarter in at CNM. So we will have multiple community conversations. So any of you who are on this call or listen to this video later, if you're interested in hosting or being a part of a panel or bringing in your own panel during our um, sustainability uh, community conversations on Friday, they will always be in this time slot, Fridays 9 to 11. Feel free to reach out to me and we will help you pull something together, all right? Um, so I just really wanted to, to kind of open it up and this is for everyone. Uh, where are we? What do we need to do next? And policy. I still feel we have to hang our hat on, on something that we can go and do. For those who are, of us who are not, you know, boots on the ground, like what the work that Donovan, we're about to do with Donovan. There are some people that like to let their pen do the talk. So I'm gonna open it up and shut my mouth. Thank you, Don. Um, I just wanna say that breaking free of the silos is going to be critical in making progress. Um, and the work that I do, I. I bring all, all things back to uh, mobility because it's access. Um, very few things can touch or impact social equity, education, economy, our individual and community health outcomes, um, environment and sustainability the way that piece can. It's not the sexiest piece, but um, it really does impact all of the areas that we consider quality of life markers. Um, I would encourage anyone and everyone on the call to check out the Transit Citizen Leadership Academy. Um, that's something you can do, learn more about the process, the funding, what's out there. Um, but it, it's so important, and it was mentioned earlier, um, just coming together and, and making this conversation uh, top of mind over and over and over again with new people over and over and over again, right? Because once to your point on about starting the having that fire, you've got to start that fire and a lot of little fires <laughs> and a lot of people to amass greater, greater sounding voices, right? Um, to push through better supportive policies and um, make things happen. Um, it takes a lot of us, not, not a single one of us can do it. Um, it's going to take all of us, all hands on deck. Um, as they say. So thank you for this opportunity to share um, my little two cents with you and um, have a happy and a great rest of the weekend. Dawn, um, can I say something? Um, Jessica, I, I like your, 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 your fire analogy. I like it because one of my tagline is that I'm a ocean boiler. <clears throat> and I see people join me to boil the ocean. And I've been criticized for being an ocean boiler and now I'm a ocean boilerism. Uh, these are very large problems. And we can't address large problems with, you know, one's we just can't. Um, I just shared with groups um, a policy initiative. Um, it, uh, wait, it's CPACE. Uh, CPACE is a piece of legislation that was passed in Tennessee recently. Tennessee is one of 37 states that um, provide property owners, commercial property owners, with the ability to upgrade their structures so that they are um, environmentally, they are eco, they save, it, so um, upgrades to be more energy efficient. Um, there's a business opportunity, economic development. I'm all about economic development. And uh, it's how to train people to provide these services, but the other, the, 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 the policy side to it is doing it for residential um, property, not just commercial. There are three states that have residential, California, Missouri, and Florida. And the way that this works is that if it's $10,000 to do the upgrades, the $10,000 plus, let's say two, 3% is built into, it's assessed on your property taxes. 
when you pay your property taxes, you'll see an increase of, let's say, $20 because it's over a year and it's a fixed rate. So investors get to invest in this and people get to upgrade uh, their homes and their commercial property so that they're saving money. They're also increasing the value. And when they sell, uh, they are selling at a higher price. Uh, and that own, that note can also be transferred over to the purchaser uh, or it gets paid off. But the key is you're, you've been saving. And when people are saving money in our model, we take a percentage and we're going to invest it on their behalf. There's a policy side to get that same piece of legislation available for. Thank you, Donovan. King or Everett, any other words? And then the rest of you as well, anyone can chime in. Just kind of thank you for the resources. I will be sending the info from the chat. So you will have that. Go ahead. Um, I'll just say, I mean, first of all, thank you, Don, for organizing this, just as other people have said, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, I think that these community conversations are a great starting place for things. And so I just want to thank you on behalf of a Nashvilleian that I'm glad that this is happening and it's because of you. So thank you. Um, and then as far as the other piece, I, I would say that um, another point of engagement for, for me and my world, obviously the NSS part, uh, which I sent the link for, but also with TCV, TCV is actively looking for, uh, we're, we're trying to diversify across the state and have a more accurate representation of what the state looks like tapped into the state legislature. So if you are a part of any community, uh, any diverse community, any community that, maybe historically underrepresented at the state legislature, I would be interested in talking to you because we're kind of working on building up that uh, basis across the, the state. So if you want more information about that, please email me. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great conversation. Happy to be here. That is excellent. And thank you for that, that olive branch. And I'll make sure I get some people over to you from the, the communities that we serve here at CNM as well. Yeah, I would just like Who to else? echo the thing. This has definitely been a, a nice welcome to, to Nashville and the Tennessee, broader Tennessee community. Uh, I love the idea of a fellowshipping and a fellowshipping, especially for a purpose. And so I'm, I'm excited that we were already able to get uh, an initiative out of this. I'm excited to to learn that there are so many other partners and advocates uh, and friends, you know, who, who are working for a more just and equitable world. I don't have any specific asks right now, but I, I do think I will as I start to um, involve myself more uh, in the community. So as as we proceed in this fight together, definitely look out for ways that uh, uh, ask, you know, to, 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 to help me uh, be better, be a better advocate. Excellent. Thank you so much. Is there a free zone right now? For some reason, I'm frozen. I don't know if everyone's frozen. No, you're not frozen. Oh, okay, awesome. I think I think she froze right after we said that. Well, if she's frozen and gone, I'll step in um, and just uh, thank everybody for participating. If anybody, anybody, any last comments that anyone has before we give you your 15 or 20 minutes back? Oh, Terry. Okay, there we are. Oh, there you are. Yeah. I was, I was taking over. You, you did freeze as soon as we told you you weren't frozen. There you, there you were. <laughs> well, I just wanted to see if there were others who have uh, final comments. Or well, I think 
this is a sign that it's Friday and uh, a short uh, a week due to the holiday and we should get on with our weekend. But um, I'm excited about the things I heard today. Um, love that Donovan is already um, getting the group together to apply for a, uh, that planning grant for TANF funds. It's just an awesome opportunity. So um, thanks to Dawn. We'll thank her in her, app, in her frozen state um, for uh, guiding us through this this morning. It's great to meet all of you. So thanks so much. Have a good Have a good one. Afternoon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. All right. What I left.